Hey everyone, so welcome to my 11th lecture on the course Ordinary Differential Equations. So today we are going to talk about one of the very important theorem in Ordinary Differential Equations. Trust me, you will realize its importance once you solve more and more examples. Okay, so what is the agenda for today's talk? I will talk about linear independence and dependence first. You might have seen this in linear algebra, but if at all you have not seen or the concept is not clear, don't worry, I will give you a flavor over here and then we will jump towards the Vronskyan and then we will see an important theorem by J. Vronsky. I think James Vronsky. I am not sure about the initials, but yeah, he gave this important theorem and I will take some very nice examples which will which will make you realize the importance of this theorem. So that's what the agenda is. Now let's see what do you mean, what do you mean by independence and dependence of vectors. Now suppose you have n vectors, say v1 to vn. Now what you do is you take its linear combination equal to zero. What are these scalars? This c1, c2, cn are scalars. Let me treat them as a real number. So these are our real numbers. So if the linear combination of these vectors is zero, you try to find the constants. If all the constants are zero, then we say the given set of vectors are linearly independent. And if even some of the scalars comes out to be non-zero, then we say that these vectors are linearly dependent. Dependent means what? One vector can be obtained from another vector. Okay, so if you are able to obtain one vector from remaining set of vectors, that means what? They are depending on each other. And that's why the word dependent. So uh, let me take one example. So if I take v1 equal to 1 comma 1 and v2 equal to 3 comma 3. So is v1 and v2 are these two vectors linearly independent or dependent? So as you can see, your v2 is nothing but 3 times v1. That means what? v2 can be obtained by v1. That means what? v2 can be obtained from v1 by simply multiplying by this scalar which is 3. So since v2 is 3 times v1, that means what? v1 and v2 are linearly dependent because they can be obtained from one another. So this is an example of linearly dependent vectors. Let's take the second example. Suppose v1 is x square, v2 is x cube and v3 is 2x square minus x cube. Now here as you can see your v3 is nothing but twice v1 plus minus 1 into v2. So here also your v3 can be obtained from v1 and v2. Therefore these three vectors are also linearly dependent. So when one can be obtained from another, we say those are dependent vectors. Now, when you say something to be independent, if one cannot be obtained from another by some combination, linear combination. Suppose your v1 is x and v2 is x square. Now here, you multiply your v1 by any number, you will never obtain v2, right? Because here if I multiply by number, your degree will never be changed. So multiplying v1 or v2 by a number will never give you any one of the vectors. So therefore, v1 and v2 are linearly independent over the real numbers. Well, this is not the proof. You need to prove it by this way. But just I want to give you the feel. That's why I'm just telling you this is how one can feel it. Okay. Similarly, if you take cos x and sin x, then even these two are linearly independent because you multiply cos by any number, you will never get sin x, right? So sin and cos, they are not multiple of each other. So this is what the concept of dependence and independence is. Now, I won't be proving that these are independent. Why? Because I will tell you a notion of Ronskian and with the help of that notion, this becomes a very easy thing to prove. You are not required to use this definition. Okay. So let's see what do you mean by Vronskian of functions. Okay. So suppose if you have two functions y1 and y2, then I will define its Vronskian as a determinant of a two cross two matrix. So it's a determinant of first row is y1, y2, second row is y1 prime and y2 prime. Now here I'm only saying y2, y1 as functions, okay, not solutions. So if you can define Vronskian for any functions. Obviously, since I'm taking derivative, so obviously I'm take, talking about at least one once differentiable functions. So at least these are differentiable, then this is how you can define its Vronskian. Some author also take it as this way. And you can see that this value will be same as this value. Okay, determinant of this two cross two matrix will be same as determinant of this two matrix. Why? Because determinant of a matrix is same as determinant of its transpose. So therefore you take any one of them is fine. I will be preferring the first one. So this is how you define the Vronskian for two functions. How will you define the Vronskian for three functions? So if you have y1, y2, y3 as three functions, not solutions, three functions which are twice differentiable, then you can define its Vronskian as this three cross three matrix. First row, the functions, second row, its first derivative, third row, its second derivative. And similarly, if you have n functions, say, 
y1 to yn then we define its Wronskian as first row will be the function second row will be the first derivative and last row will be the n minus 1th derivative so if you have n functions which are n minus 1 times differentiable then you can define its Wronskian in this way so this is how you can define the Wronskian of n functions okay now let's see the connection between linear independence dependence and the Wronskian so suppose if you have two functions which are linearly dependent I am only saying functions okay not solutions so if y1 and y2 are functions which are linearly dependent then their Wronskian has to be zero everywhere okay for all values of x your Wronskian is always zero now it's a very easy proof y1 and y2 are linearly dependent means what y1 can be obtained from y2 or y2 can be obtained from y1 by some scalar multiplication so what do we have here is y1 equal to c times y2 where c is what any constant so now what will be our Wronskian this is the definition substituting the value what do we get c y2 y2 c y2 prime y2 prime and the determinant is nothing but zero so if you have two functions which are linearly dependent then its Wronskian is always zero and the same theorem or the same fact is true for three functions if you have three functions which are linearly dependent then the Wronskian will be the determinant of a 3 cross 3 matrix y1 y2 y3 first derivative and the second derivative you try to find the determinant it will come out to be zero and this is true for n functions as well if you have n linearly independent functions then its Wronskian is always zero okay so this is a first important fact which one should observe now you must have seen uh, mathematical logic as one of your subject right or one of the topic what you have learned over there if p implies q is a correct statement then its contrapositive is also a correct statement that means what negation q implies negation p so here dependency implies Wronskian is zero so what will be the contrapositive if the Wronskian is non-zero then the functions are linearly independent so that's the second fact if the Wronskian is non-zero then y1 and y2 are linearly independent over some interval I will talk about the interval when I will state the theorem but this is what the contrapositive becomes and now you can see why your sin x and cos x are linearly independent because if you try to find this Wronskian y1 and y2 sin x cos x what is derivative of sin x cos x what is derivative of cos x minus sin x and if you solve this this will come out to be minus 1 which is non-zero so since the Wronskian is non-zero therefore sin and cosine are linearly independent functions okay over real number try with x and x square which we took right so here x it will be x square here 1 here it will be 2x and what answer you will get is 2x square and it is non-zero over r minus 0 means minus infinity comma 0 union 0 comma infinity so one can ask the question when is the converse true so what was the fact one the fact one was if y1 and y2 are linearly dependent functions then their Wronskian is zero so is the converse true that means if the Wronskian is zero can you conclude that the functions are linearly dependent answer is no so i should give you a counter example and the counter example is if you take y1 as x mod x and y2 as x square over the interval minus 1 comma 1 then over this interval these two functions are not linearly independent so first thing is let's try to find this Wronskian so what is the Wronskian it is y1 y2 derivative of x mod x is 2 mod x then derivative of derivative of x square is 2x and when you try to solve this what you get is you get Wronskian to be 0 so Wronskian of these two functions is 0 but we will see that over this interval these two functions are not linearly dependent these are linearly independent so Wronskian 0 does not imply that the functions are dependent they can be independent so let's try to prove why they are linearly independent so if we have the linear combination of y1 and y2 equal to 0 what we want to prove we want to prove c1 and c2 are 0 what is y1 x mod x what is y2 x square now this is 0 for all x okay so you keep on changing x over this interval your linear combination is 0 now what, what question is if such a thing is there what is my c1 and c2 now suppose since this is true for all x this is true if i replace my x by 1 by 2 so if i replace my x by 1 by 2 still this is true so what do i get i get c1 by 4 plus c2 by 4 equal to 0 and this is nothing but c1 plus c2 equal to 0 now this is also true if my x is minus 1 by 2 because this is true for all x so this equation is also true when i put x equal to minus half when i put x equal to minus half this is nothing but minus c1 by 4 plus c2 by 4 equal to 0 and this 
is nothing but minus c1 plus c2 equal to 0. So we got this two equation, you add them up, you get c2 equal to 0, you put c2 equal to 0 here, you get c1 equal to 0 as well. So here if the linear combination is 0, then these two functions are linearly independent over this interval. Okay, if I take 1 comma 3, then they are dependent, actually both are same, because over 1 comma 3 interval, my x is positive, so your mod x is nothing but x only. Okay, so this is x square, this is x square over 1 comma 3 interval. But over this interval, it's linearly independent. Okay, so interval matters a lot. Okay? And that's why intervals are important. So this is a counter example to this statement that the converse is not true. Then obviously one can ask the question, when is the converse true? And the answer is our next big theorem. So let's see what the theorem is. Okay, so here is our important theorem. Okay, so what does the theorem say is if you have a second order linear homogeneous differential equation where P and Q are what? They are continuous functions of X over some interval I. Okay, so there will be some interval over which they are continuous. For example, if your P and Q are suppose sin X and cos X, then they are continuous over whole real number. Suppose your P of X is 1 by X and your q of x is 1 upon x minus 1 then what will be the interval it will be whole real numbers except 0 and 1 because at 0 and 1 p and q are not continuous they are not defined hence not continuous okay so that's why this interval i is there okay so it's the domain of continuity for p and q so if y1 and y2 are two solutions of equation 1 then they are linearly dependent on i interval if and only if Vronsky is 0 at some point in that interval Okay, so this is what the theorem is. Now, if you recall, just now what we proved, we proved if the solutions or we proved that if you have two functions, need not be the solutions, if you have two functions which are dependent, then the Vronskian is always zero. That's what we proved. And I ask you, when is the converse true? Here is the answer. So, when is the converse true? If the Vronskian is zero and those y1 and y2 are the solutions of some differential equation then they has to be linearly dependent so this is when the converse is true so if the Vronskian of two functions is zero then those two functions need not be dependent i gave you a counter example so question is when they are true so when the Vronskian is zero and those two functions are the solutions of some differential equation then the theorem says they have to be linearly independent over the interval. So for a solution things, this is if and only if. If I say two functions, then only this way is always true. Which way? This way. And when you have the solutions, then converse is also true. So I hope this part is clear. Furthermore, what he proved, he proved that if Vronskin is zero even at one point, then Vronskin is zero over the whole interval. Okay, so, so they are dependent on i if and only if Vronskin is zero everywhere. Okay, so even if the Vronskian is non-zero at some point, that means what? They will be independent, right? Because what will be the contrapositive of this linearly independent if and only if Vronskian is non-zero. So even at some point, Vronskian comes out to be non-zero, then they are linearly independent. All this I am talking provided y1 and y2 are the solutions. Okay, otherwise this is not if and only if statement. Okay, so let me tell you four takeaways which you should take up from this lecture and the theorem will also be clear and I hope that won't create any confusion. So first one is if you have two linearly dependent functions then their Vronskin is always zero and if P implies Q is a correct statement negation Q implies negation P is also a correct statement. So what is negation of this? If Vronskin is non-zero over an interval that means y1 and y2 are linearly independent. Okay so for this two thing y1 and y2 are any functions. Okay, I'm not stressing that they has to be the solutions. They can, they need not be. Whereas for third and fourth point, which talks about the converse of first two statements. So converse need not be true. I give you the example x square and x mod x. Okay. So then the question is when is the converse true? So for the converse, we need additional two more things. Okay. So if y1 and y2 are solutions, then Vronskian zero implies dependency, which is the third point. And independence implies Vronskian non-zero, which is my fourth point. So for converse, you need solutions as well. So this is the four statements which you should make sure is clear. And that's what the takeaway from today's lecture is. Okay, so now let me take one last example and then we will stop. 
so this is the example there are some standard examples which i will give you as a homework part but this is the example which i really like and this is unique i mean you will hardly find this kind of example so what is the question you have two functions you have two functions x square and 1 minus x square over the interval minus 1 comma 1 they are continuous yes they are the polynomials so they are continuous question is can they ever be the solution of a second order homogeneous linear differential equation so can these two function together can be a solution of one differential equation that's what the question is now there are infinitely many differential equations in the world will you keep on checking for each and every differential equation no right that's not even feasible so here we will see the importance of the previous theorem well it has many importance but this is one of them now what we do is we prove by contradiction so suppose y1 and y2 are solution of some differential equation which is nothing but let's call this as the differential equation now this is fixed differential equation this is fixed and what we have that we are assuming that y1 and y2 are solution of this differential equation okay now is y1 and y2 linearly independent or dependent as you can see you cannot obtain x square from 1 minus x square right you multiply 1 minus x square by any number you will never get x square or you multiply x square by any number you will never get 1 minus x square so therefore they are linearly independent now so what does the theorem says if you have solutions and if they are linearly independent the fourth point then the Vronskian has to be non-zero over the whole interval right so in this case what will be the Vronskian your Vronskian will be nothing but x square 1 minus x square 2x minus 2x and if you solve this is nothing but 2x and is this non-zero over the whole interval no right at 0 this is becoming 0 so therefore the theorem says if you have a solutions then y1 and y2 are independent if and only if Vronskian is non-zero over the whole interval now over since we have the interval minus 1 comma 1 which has a 0 therefore Vronskian is not 0 on whole interval okay so these two functions over this interval together can never be a solution of a differential equation okay so it's a very beautiful theorem i hope this is clear if this is clear well and good if not you can ask me in the comment section now let me give you some couple of examples for practice so here are some examples for you people to practice you have to check whether they're independent or dependent so check whether these two functions are independent or dependent over i Vronskian non-zero simply independent okay so check whether these three functions are independent on our three cross three matrix for Vronskian sin and cos on real number x square x mod x on 7 comma 100 interval sin hyperbolic x e raised to x and e raised to minus x check whether they are independent or dependent for this you can assume they are the solution of some differential equation which differential equation that you will come to know in couple of lectures actually no need to go by Vronskian also if you know the relation between this and this if you don't know go by Vronskian so solve these problems any doubt ask me in the comment section if you get the answer, post the answer in the comment section and I hope today's lecture is clear. Thank you and have a nice day.